and she was also the first German Goldman Environmental Prize winner. Erwald played a key role in convincing both the Norwegian government pension fund and Germany's Allianz to divest from most of their coal holdings. So, Hepa. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I'm here to talk about a new tool um, <clears throat> for what we call impact divesting. And, um, you know, at this conference, at many other conferences I've been to, we all talk about phasing out the coal industry and we talk about stopping funding for the coal industry, but um, often it's not clear that the people talking about this really know who the coal industry is. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, coal companies, as we found, they can come under ridiculous names like China Africa Sunlight, which is a company which is planning a new coal plant in Zimbabwe, or names like Limor Resources, which is a South African company which is um, developing coal mines in Madagascar, or Eastern Pearl, which is a Thai company, which is a coal trader. Um, Our first experience with trying to identify coal companies was when we, in, I don't know, a crazy or inspired action, decided we were going to analyze the holdings of the Norwegian government pension fund, which happens to have investments in over 8,000 companies, and is one of the world's largest uh, investors worldwide. And the thing is that in um, different campaigns, we kept on running across the Norwegian government pension fund as the owner of, of different uh, companies, so we became interested. And the Norwegian government pension fund, it's managed by Norges Bank. And Norges Bank, <clears throat> Norway's central bank, uh, is a real power. Norges Bank at that time, in 2014, was telling the public, was telling journalists, was telling politicians, look, our investments in coal, they're marginal, they're already declining. There's really nothing to worry about. We're, we're, we're not very invested in this area. Now, <clears throat> the result of sort of this combing through 8,000 companies was that uh, we actually identified what we call a coal portfolio of 8.8 .8 billion euros. Norges Bank had said they only have investments in the coal industry of 267 million euros. You know, so we found 32 times as much as Norges Bank was saying was in the portfolio. And we weren't worried by that because it's not that we thought that you know, Norges Bank was lying or something, but there seemed to be a systemic problem. And this systemic problem has to do with the way that large investors and banks, that they manage their portfolios, the way they, the industry definitions that they use, and um, <clears throat> really according to sort of the standard industry classification uh, benchmarks, um, coal companies in their view are only companies which uh, derive over 50% of their revenues from coal mining. That is the coal industry. This is not a coal investment. This is a utility investment according to the industry classification benchmarks. Now we obviously had a different view on that, and um, NGOs in Norway had a different view on that, and um, as it happily ended up, the Norwegian parliament also had a different view on that, but um, Norges Bank was at the beginning, they don't, you know, they weren't that interested in having the parliament sort of restrict, uh, uh, come up with new restrictions, and what they did was, as a reaction to our report, this was in February 2015, they actually got rid of a lot of their coal mining uh, um, <clears throat> equities and you know, we were cheered on by the Guardian for this. But this kind of led us to look at the portfolio again and to, uh, to figure out what happened. And what we actually saw was that there was a shift that, for example, in the US, they'd gotten rid of around 800 million um, corona in investments in U.S. coal mining companies, but they'd actually increased their investments in coal-based utilities in the U.S. And so we started worrying about a lot of those divestment actions where just coal mining companies are being dropped. Where is that money going? Is it being reinvested maybe in coal-based utilities? So in our view of what is impact divesting, um, if you really want to keep coal in the ground, you need to cover both sides of this problem. 
Um, so the Norwegian parliament came up, um, was convinced also by our new study called Still Dirty, Still Dangerous, um, to um, um, instruct Norges Bank to divest all companies which base over 30% of their power production or their revenues on coal. This was a big success. I don't know why this slide is so strange. Uh, <laughs> we will just go on. Uh, we decided that, you know, since we saw this problem in Norway, we decided to, to also talk to other investors and other banks, and we discovered really that uh, large parts of the finance industry, they have uh, either very limited definitions of what, who the coal industry is, and um, that there is, and that it would be um, to, to really to reach a new level in terms of addressing the whole coal industry, uh, both through NGO campaigning, but also through actions of uh, climate conscientious investors, that we needed a kind of a global divestment to do list. And so we started uh, digging through. Our first idea was to say, let's look at self identification. Who is self identifying as a member of the coal industry? So we visited all of these sort of national coal associations and looked at who's on their membership list. And then we combed through different databases and so on, and people in the office were looking like this, <laughs> because we discovered the coal industry is just so much bigger than we ourselves thought and, and than most people think. You know, you're going on a blind date with a dwarf, but actually you end up with a giant. <laughs> so when we realized that there are virtually thousands of companies with coal-related business, we decided, okay, we need to focus and we need to find sort of what are the most important parts of the industry that have to go. And we developed three criteria that captured the bulk of the coal industry, the biggest companies in the industry, but also the companies that are at the forefront of expansion. We thought the 30% criteria that the Norwegian Parliament had uh, decided that this was a reasonable place to start for a large investor in terms of revenues and power generation, but we thought you know, the, the revenue percentage is, and the power percentage, it's very much sort of about how much of this company's business revolves around coal. It doesn't really tell us in terms of um, um, absolute figures, what is the absolute size of this company's coal operations? What danger does it pose to the climate? So we came up with an absolute threshold, and now this is uh, a bit arbitrary, but uh, um, um, 20 million tons of coal, that's a lot of coal, that's about what Italy consumes in one year as a country, um, and 10,000 in, uh, 10, 10, installed megawatts of coal capacity. <coughs> then we also thought mm -hmm. if divestment is really supposed to have an impact, then um, actually you've got to avoid investing in the first place in a lot of companies that are tr still trying to expand the coal industry. Um, <clears throat> so what we discovered when taking a closer look was that also the industry is just so much more diverse than we thought. You know, one always thinks about coal miners and uh, coal power companies, but there are all of these other companies that have different roles along uh, the thermal coal value chain. And these companies potentially, they could play a very important role also for the for the uh, <clears throat> expansion of the industry, if you think about coal transport companies building infrastructure, the question whether central Borneo coal mines are going to be developed or in Botswana depends very much on whether coal transportation ra railroads are going to be built in those regions. Or if you think about the specialized coal, coal plant manufacturers who, if you think of the Chinese company Harbin Electric, for example, have less business in China now that the coal plant uh, buildup is, is, going, is, is going down and look to other countries abroad to still go on uh, being able to manufacture coal plants. These types of companies, they often have to play a very important role behind the scenes in terms of arranging finance and um, pushing forward plans for new coal projects. Now the global coal exit list itself, it has 775 companies, of which 218 are mining companies, 214 are power producers, coal power producers, and 110 companies actually do both. And we have 233 service companies on the list, 
The service companies are the ones I talked about earlier who manufacture coal, um, specialized coal equipment, do coal transport, do coal trading. So all in all, the companies we've captured on this list, um, they represent 88% of world coal production and 86% of installed coal capacity worldwide. Uh, the area where we would say that the list is probably weakest is uh, this area of service companies because they're often quite hard to figure out. Um, this is what the list looks like. It has basic figures on <clears throat> where companies and which countries they have their coal-based activities. Uh, how much megawatt of new coal they're planning, what their coal share of revenue or their coal share of power generation is, what their installed capacity is, what their annual coal production is, um, these types of figures. And now I'm just going to take a quick look at, um, from the information we have from the Global Coal Exit List, what this means for d different sort of divestment models. If you look at the US, CalPERS and CalSTRS, um, the divestment model that they're using is, they're two of the US biggest pension funds. They're only divesting coal miners and only if they uh, have over 50% of their revenues uh, comes from coal. Um, if I think about AXA, they're divesting um, coal miners and also coal-based utilities, but only if 50% or more of their revenues come from coal. Allianz, they're doing what the Norwegian government pension fund does. They're using a 30% criteria. This is already a lot better. And they're applying it both to coal miners and coal power companies. And this is kind of what the volume of those coal divestment actions looks like then. And actually, CalSTRS is still too big, I see on the slide. Even I've adjusted it for reflecting the fact that CalSTRS is smaller in terms of its overall portfolio than either AXA or Allianz, but um, yeah. I don't even mention the amount, it's less than 10 million that have been invested by CalSTRS. Um, <clears throat> now to take a look at this from the other side. Um, I mean, having all of this uh, inf company uh, related information in one database, all of a sudden you can answer questions like, well, who are the world's biggest coal producers, actually? And uh, we find that 30 companies produce half of the world's coal. That's, um, if you look at which of those companies have a coal share of revenue above 50%, out of those 30 companies, it's only 11. That means even in terms of the coal production, you as a big investor have in your portfolio two thirds even of the coal mining problem, it's still in there if you're using this 50% criteria. Let's say you're the Norwegian government pension fund and you're using 30%. Even so, you're, you're still going to have 10 companies that are not captured by even the 30% threshold that belong to the world's biggest coal producers. So even some of the big institutions, I mean, who I want to um, praise, but still we have to see they have a lot of coal in their portfolio, even a lot of coal mining. Glencore is an example of that. It's the world's eighth largest coal miner, but it's not captured by these criteria because its coal share of revenue is 20%. At the same time, Glencore runs the World Coal Association. You know, If they aren't part of the coal industry, I don't know who is. The other thing that the Global Coal Exit List does is <clears throat> it's a forward-looking divestment tool. Um, it tries to capture who are the expansionists um, within the coal industry. We found in total <clears throat> 282 companies that want to build new coal power, <clears throat> 225 that have plans for expanding coal mining. You, can't add, uh, you shouldn't add those figures because there's overlap. Uh, I'm going to skip here because we've heard a lot of this and we're running out of time. Uh, I want to <clears throat> sort of get to a special part of, of, of the global coal exit list. Um, we've, um, through the experience we've had in engaging and campaigning on large investors and banks, I mean, we've noticed that large investors are very conservative. They don't want to do too much at once. They usually, even if they're starting on the divestment road, they'll do it one step at a time. So one of the reactions we got when uh, we were actually speaking to a large U.S. bank, 
and uh, we were talking about this list that we're preparing that's going to have around 800 companies on it and other uh, people from the bank were just like can you give us a short list please I mean you know <laughs> can we have like a hundred companies maybe and so that did lead us to think about well if you know an investor really does want to do something where should they start and our view on that is the very first most important thing to do is to get rid of coal plant developers in uh, um, in portfolios um, and to avoid new investment in these companies. We're not just talking about divestment, we're talking about stopping, changing new investment flows. Um, <clears throat> so we came up with a list of, you know, we wanted to challenge the bank a little bit more than they thought they could be challenged, so we came up with a list within the Global Coal Exit list of the 120 top coal plant developers. These are companies that represent two-thirds of the global pipeline of new coal power stations. The list is also geographically weighted to sort of cover the top players in each region. And we also took care to sort of identify the companies for whom um, the expansion of coal capacity and coal, new coal really is a part of their business strategy. And it's to address the companies that want to turn Egypt you know, <laughs> have them go from zero installed coal megawatt to over 17,000, or Botswana to go, you know, uh, from 600 megawatt to over 4,000. And these are the same types of, of situations that Jerry was talking about before, and it's very much driven by big companies here who go there and, you know, who sell this sort of as a package deal. Um, the so doing this in so-called frontier countries, it's especially <coughs> harmful, of course, because um, you know you're bringing whole new countries onto into a cycle of coal dependency. And I mean, coming from Germany, we see here how just how difficult it is once you have a coal industry to get rid of it. And what is the point of building a coal industry in Botswana, Malawi, Kenya, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, or, I mean, these are really sort of, uh, we see them as a priority companies. It's like the worst, <laughs> the worst thing you could do possibly do with your money. Um, so just sort of the last fact-based bit at the end, if you look at the, the coal share of power production of the 120 largest coal plant developers, um, and you're even using, like, let's say, the Norwegian and the Allianz criteria, which are the best, the 30%, you're still only getting rid of around half of those top, top coal plant developers. And one of the reasons is that either the companies are very diversified, like Marubeni, or they're companies uh, like Petro Vietnam that are not that diversified, but they're coming from a different part of the energy sector and they want to get in, they think getting into coal is a new idea. Or because you have companies that have zero energy related or coal related business up to now, but they also think that coal in Asia is a good bet, like this Malaysian company Toyo Inc, who sees building coal plants as her new model. Don't know what kind of business consultants they have. So um, if you have the goal to cut off um, all new investment in the coal industry and, um, and to push banks and uh, investors to do the right thing um, and to align their portfolios <laughs> with 1.5 degrees, then um, oh, this is, uh, is self-praise from um, people we've allowed to sort of test the global coal exit list. I'm not going to read it. So tomorrow, um, <laughs> we're launching it. And please go to www.coalexit.org. We're very excited. We really want to see uh, divestment go to a new dimension. Thank you.